So I'm really excited to introduce our author today, Pamela Slim. Pam was born and raised in the Bay Area and now lives in Mesa, Arizona with her family. She is a former corporate manager and entrepreneur for over a decade and spent a lot of time consulting with companies like Cisco, HP, and Charles Schwab. So Pam's coached thousands of employees, both in corporations and later helping them get out of those corporations and start their own small businesses. She has one of the top business and marketing blogs on the internet, Escape from Cubicle Nation. And her book of the same name came out last spring in 2009 and was voted the Small Business Book of the Year. Fun fact about Pam is that she also spent 15 years tra uh, training, teaching, and coaching martial arts and spent 10 of those years working with gang members in the Mission District of San Francisco. So please give a warm welcome to Pamela Slim. Well, thank you. These days I couldn't do much, but it's a good thing for an intro to a presentation in case anybody challenges me. I can always play that card. <laughs> so thanks so much for having me. I am really excited to be here back at home. As Jenny is saying, I was born and raised here in the Bay Area. And um, one of the interesting things, I think, for context for this talk, uh, I'm, I love Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? Are you social media users? Okay. So when I was mentioning to people that I was coming out to Google, it was very interesting to hear the kind of comments that I got back. Most of them were, why in the world would Google <laughs> bring you, Escape from Cubicle Nation lady, <laughs> inside their company to talk to their employees, right? It sounds like kind of a crazy idea. And the, the analogy that I thought of is, is if I'd sent my husband away with Salma Hayek for the weekend. You know, it's just, I mean, why, why would I ever do that? Um, <laughs> the idea, uh, knowing my husband the way that I know him and knowing Google the way that I know of you, is it actually is the most sane thing in the world, I think, nowadays, that we start to talk very openly about the new world of work. We are no longer in a work environment where you're only going to be an employee in your career or you're only gonna be an entrepreneur. For some of you, you might already be working on plans, on side hustles already, things that you're you know, getting going on the side. Some of you might have come from smaller businesses and you're, you're staying some time here. Some of you may want to be staying here a long time, which is great, and building a whole career, but maybe moving around a lot as you actually go through that process of transition. So one of the things that I love the most now about writing openly at Escape from Cubicle Nation is I can really talk about the things that I found were going on in people's minds when I was consulting here for so many years. Um, and I think that a lot of it is related to uh, kind of comebacks to dating, right? Everything can come back to dating analogies. So if any of you are on the market or you ever have been, I'm happily married now. But you know that desperation is usually not a very good way to be attracting somebody. The more secure you are, the more you know yourself, the more you're truly just interested in meeting somebody else, the more you're going to really be attracting quality people. And that, I think, is what's really true for companies. So a secure company that has an amazing history, that's doing really amazing work, that has really smart people working for it, uh, has nothing to worry about. If, if people were worried that those of you sitting right here in the middle of Silicon Valley didn't know how to start a company, <laughs> You know, that's, there's no way that I can teach you that in an hour. You probably already know you're connected through your networks with people who are. So the key is, is to really look at what is a common framework that you can use that's going to apply whether or not you're in a company or you, you decide to go out on your own. And, and a lot of it is really related to your quality of life. So when I really saw a lot of this happening, a lot more open dialogue about the new world of work, was in 2009. I know for me it was during a time when I saw the picture of the Lehman Brothers employee coming out. Do you remember that where he had his stuff in a cardboard box? I think it was uh, on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And that was a moment personally where I went, oof, you know, things are really different now. Do you guys have a similar memory? Was there any moment you had during the whole economic crash where you remembered when things are not the same? I don't know if you have a a memory from that time. For me, it really was the Lehman Brothers. I don't know the kind of waves that we're going through here. But uh, what I knew at that time was that 
we were never going to be making the same assumptions again uh, because of the creative destruction that we've had in the economy, I actually think of it as a really, really good, healthy thing. I, I have personally lived through some really difficult challenges. My husband has a construction business in Phoenix, Arizona. If any of you know what's going on in the last couple of years in Phoenix, Arizona, we've had tremendous strain. The whole market crashed. And um, at the same time, it's, it was really unsustainable. There were things about the way in which we were working that was really not sustainable. So what happened when our economy crashed <clears throat> is that all of a sudden we realized that we're all self-employed. Every single one of us, no matter how you work, if you're an employee, if you're a contractor, if you have your own business, we're all self-employed. Nothing is guaranteed. And so this actually provides, I think, a lot of liberation, a lot of opportunity, a lot of ways to really think strategically about your career, uh, a lot of ways you can think about managing others where you don't have to worry about trying to keep somebody anywhere by force knowing that everybody has free will and there's a lot of different options for how people move. So knowing that, there are some frameworks and ways I think you can manage your career that are going to be really helpful for you. So <clears throat> the first is the context of this talk. And it actually came uh, when I was having a conversation with my best friend. And her daughter is in high school. She's a junior in high school. And she's getting ready to go away to college. And she enrolled in a nail technician class. And my best friend was a little bit dismayed by this because she's like, she's professional, she's worked for her whole career and she thought, you know, I've really raised you to go to college and, you know, I'm not quite sure what this new career track you're talking about. And her daughter goes, Mom, that's my side hustle. That's what I'm going to use when I'm in college when I need to make some money. And her mom went from feeling a little bit dismayed and concerned to feeling overwhelmingly proud of her daughter for really thinking in a smart way about how to, how to generate money and have a side hustle. And this is a term that I'm using a lot now um, in, in the place where I operate, uh, talking with tens of thousands of employees from all over the world each year through my blog. Many, 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 many people have a side hustle. Now, we're recording this, so I won't ask you all to raise your hand <laughs> to say how many of you have a side hustle. I would imagine in a group of smart uh, people that I hope you do. It's really the wave of the future as a lot of people are working on a side project or maybe you have a thought for something you really love to do that you generate a little bit of income on the side or maybe you have a vision for a startup that's a couple years down the road and you're working on that. So the side hustle I think is something that everybody everywhere should always be thinking about. It's really what is something that's the root of my passion that I'm highly interested in, that I can begin to test and try in little ways on the side to see if it has viability. Um, it's, it's something where you, you can tell me if I'm accurate in making the correlation here, but some of the projects that might be worked on with a 20% time that you have here, to me, are akin to a side hustle. You know, it's like this, this is a really cool idea. I want to try it. I want to see if it works. I'm not sure, but I want to put a little bit of resource to it. And so having that perspective, it keeps you stretching, it keeps you growing. For uh, many of the people that I run into all the time on my blog or as a coach, there are people who lose their jobs and really need to rely on their side hustle as a way to provide um, for themselves and their family. So it's a thought of instead of thinking in terms of one career path where you go to school and you become an engineer and you work only in that career path for a corporation, you can also have other interesting side hustles. Some of my clients raise alpacas at the same time of being financial analysts. People have, uh, they make, you know, spicy almond toffee at the same time of, you know, being an HR professional. So a lot of people have very interesting different kinds of side hustles. And definitely a lot of engineers that I know have side hustles with projects that they're working on to see if they have some traction. It's what keeps you fresh and really keeps you engaged. So in order to understand what might be good avenues to explore, good side hustles to explore, there's a concept that I learned from Martha Beck. If anybody knows Martha Beck, she wrote a book called Finding Your Own North Star. And she's actually who I train with as a coach. And she talks about our, our two selves, our essential and our social selves. So our essential self is essential in that it's our essence. It is the core of who we are. How many of you are parents here? Are there any parents in the room? Okay. 
If you remember, I have a two-year-old actually here on the campus. You might see them running around. <laughs> but if you remember, if, is your child older than two now? Uh, six, four, and two. Okay, six, four, and two. So you're really into the essential self. <laughs> Two-year-olds have no filter, right? Whatever it is that they're feeling, they express it right away. And actually, all of us still have that essential self inside. What happens over time is you, we learn, we're shaped by school, we're shaped by our parents, we're shaped by you know, the places where we work, the media, in order to play a certain role and to be effective. And I know um, that in many corporations, it's really not safe at all to speak up with your essential self voice. Uh, not here, of course, <laughs> but I would imagine, I know many places I've been, people inside are screaming, you know, I have to get out of this meeting and there's 345 PowerPoint slides for a one hour presentation and I can't believe we're going through another reorganization, says the essential self. The social self says, be quiet, smile, pretend like everything's okay. Now, we need both. We need the essential and the social selves in order to walk through life, right? So one analogy is, your essential self might really be drawn to medicine and your social self will actually get you through medical school and everything that's required for that, right? What happens though is you begin to plan your life and your career is it's really easy to get sidetracked by the social self. And this is where you have thoughts that, you know, what's wrong with me? Like I'm working in a great place or I have what I thought was the perfect job and I'm making a great salary and I like the people around me, but I'm just not happy. There's something here that's missing. And that's really the essential self voice. The social self might say, there's really something wrong with you because you're not happy. You know, and sometimes parents say that. <laughs> Being a parent, <clears throat> you know, sometimes that's, that's how parents can shape you with good reason, wanting to be supportive, wanting to really ha help you make good choices. The problem is, is that when you're only driving your career decisions by your social self, by what you think is the right thing to do, uh, or the socially acceptable thing to do, it can really lead to a lot of personal misery. And so the key is really tapping in and listening to your essential self. Your essential self speaks usually through your body. If, you have, if you've ever been in a time, maybe in school, where you were really stressed out and your body starts to give out on you, or you're really in a bad situation, a bad relationship, a bad job, you notice that your body really reacts in a negative way. And the same thing is true um, in a positive way. So <clears throat> using the essential and social selves are really critical to begin to shape a picture of what it is that you really want. And the best way that I think of uh, to do that is by creating a life plan. In a life plan, I just have a number of different categories here of different topics you can look at. But your life plan, really, you can first look at it that's really aside from anything to do with your current work. So you could say, if you look into the future, sometime maybe five years from now, what would your life look like? So where would you live? What would your home be like? What would your physical home be like? Uh, where do you actually want to live? What would your neighborhood be like? What kind of, what's the quality of relationships that, that you have? What are your friendships like? Are you in a relationship? Are you not? Do you have kids? Do you not? Begin to really flesh out and define the specific characteristics of really what would make your essential self feel happy. And this is why when you're doing this exercise, it's really important to not worry about what you think you should want, but rather to really tune into what actually does make you happy. So things like work content, when you're in the flow, when you're truly energized and you're doing exciting work, what are you doing? What's the nature of the work? Who are people who are exceptionally energizing to be around? And why is it? Um, I, I love, for some reason, I'm, I have nothing to do with software, I'm not an engineer at all, but I love to work around high-tech companies. There's something about that that I know when I'm in that kind of environment, I'm going to be happy. And so as you begin to go through your career, you pay attention to that and you notice what are these specific characteristics? What is it about a certain person that actually gets you excited? What is it about a certain kind of work content that gets you excited? And um, also looking at things like your financial life. What would be the picture of your finances if you could really set it up the way that you wanted to? And so when you create this picture, this vision of how it is that you want your life to look, that then becomes the framework and the blueprint for how you make choices about your career. So at different times of your life, it might look a little bit differently, right? When I was younger, when I was in my 20s and early 30s and I wasn't married, didn't have any kids, 
it, I loved to travel all the time. I was always traveling for work. I was working all the time. As Jenny said, I had my day job when I would work inside corporations. I'd you know, run off to the martial arts studio, change into my clothes, work out all night. I mean, I was a maniac in my 20s and 30s, and I loved it that way. That totally fit with my life plan at that time. Now, when I have little ones at home, that doesn't fit. And so I've really designed my business and my work to be more work that I can do mainly from home and from my, my own small office where I can spend a lot more time with my kids. So it's not like you, you have one life plan that you set and then that becomes the plan that you're always working towards. It will change and evolve as you go through time. Um, I don't know, how many of you have read Good to Great by Jim Collins? Have you read Good to Great? Jim is a totally riveting speaker. I love to hear him speak. I heard him in uh, Phoenix in, in the year 2000. And um, he talks about the sweet spot in his book, which is the intersection of three circles. So it's that which you love. For me, it's like John Legend and martial arts. <laughs> just passions that are just you know things you like, you're interested in. That which people will pay you to do, so marketable skills that you have. And then a term which he uses, which is called, what are you genetically encoded to do? Which could also be maybe what's your mission in life or what's your purpose? The, the genetically encoded to do part is one that actually takes a lot of insight and thought. He, in his own process, he described that it took him about 15 years of carrying around a notebook and making notes about what actually interested him. He called it a bug called Jim. And he, he observed himself much as if you were a scientist observing a bug and would notice what were those moments when he was really on fire? What were those conditions in his life that made things really exciting? And so when you do that, when you start to get that picture, the intersection of those three circles is your sweet spot. That, that really becomes your work, the work that you're really meant to do. And then when you get that work and you combine it with the kind of lifestyle that you want, you're living where you want to live, you're around the kind of people that you want to, that's where things become highly enjoyable. My, my philosophy about work is it should be enjoyable while you are doing it, <laughs> not just reaping the benefits from doing your work or from getting a paycheck. You know, I love to work hard. I've worked since I was 12. I, lo there's, I love to work, and I love to enjoy what I'm doing while I'm working. That's where things flow. That's where your health is better. That's where you can wake up and be excited just to look outside and, and you know, see, see the sunrise. So... The context is really thinking about the big picture of your life as the blueprint for design. Um, otherwise, it becomes more, um, the metaphor that I used in my book was like an ill-fitting shoe. Have you ever, guys ever seen Shoe Wah Wah, which is a blog about shoes? They have an ugly shoe of the week feature. <laughs> and this was an ugly shoe, one of the worst shoes of 2009, which is my personal favorite. It actually has a fish tank in the heel <laughs> with a leopard skin shoe. It's just really awful. And... This, in some cases, is what people can feel like. I'm sure there's one person where this would be the perfect pair of shoes, right? The perfect setup for them. But it's an example where if you happen to be in a situation where your social self, your friends, your family say, but that's the perfect situation. You know, why don't you like that job? You just said you wanted it. You went there. Why don't you like it? It may be because it's just an ill-fitting shoe. It would be a perfect shoe for somebody else. It's not the shoe for you. It doesn't fit with the particular conditions that really make you happy and make you flourish. So you're the one that really needs to be thinking about that. What are those conditions? And to be able to name it and say, this is what I want. These are the kinds of people that I really want to have around me, which is, to me, a really key part of the whole process. So one way to think about it, if you are in a situation where you are you know, looking at today, you may have a couple elements of what your ideal life is. If this were to be your ideal life, where everything and all the boxes were checked off, you're living where you want to live, you're making the kind of money, you're doing the kind of work that you want to do, maybe you have just a couple of those elements right now that's going on in your life. So as you think about what the next step may be, as you get yourself prepared for the next job, as you think about, um, does anybody have an example that I could work with? Like, anybody have maybe a little bit of a longer term goal of some kind of work that you want to do or maybe being in a different location. Would anybody be brave enough to give me a live example of something that would be cool to work in to your life plan? Let's work a real example here. You guys could be brave, right? No? <laughs> He's shaking his head. 
just for career. If you, you guys do career planning, right? Have you thought about some cool things to do? Can I pick on you since you're in the front row? Sure. Okay. Uh, career plans? Yeah, like let, let's say five years down the road. Is there anything, you know, something that would just be really fun and interesting to do? Okay, excellent. Working in international. Any, anywhere in particular? How about Zurich? Zurich, okay. I lived in Neuchâtel. I was in Switzerland for a year, so it's a great place to be. So you have an office in Zurich, is that right? Okay. So if I were you, right, as you're thinking about right now, you're here, you're based in the U.S., you have a plan down the road maybe to go to Zurich. Part of the way that you're going to be thinking about navigating through your experience, through your work, is first knowing what's the work going on in Zurich, right? Who are the people there? How can you begin to build relationships? You might find for the next step in your career path that you could learn a critical skill that's going to position you really well for the work that's being done in Zurich, right? Or you have the opportunity to volunteer to head up a project that's made up of people who work you know, with the staff in the Zurich office, something like that. So you're th always thinking about what are ways that you can be really working on developing particular skills or resources in order to get closer to your picture of, of the, your ideal life. And then the next step that you might take in your career, you might hit a couple other of those elements which end up in the big picture really giving you what it is that you want. The key is where you have an idea about what are you really working towards? What are these particular skills, resources, people, connections, um, that you want to make in order to get where you want to go. And what I find a lot in my work as a career coach and now a startup coach is a lot of people just kind of look to the future and just look for opportunities out of the air, which is very cool. I like to do that myself, to look for serendipity and synchronicity, and a lot of cool people can cross your path. When you put things out very clearly and you say, I want to meet Seth Godin and I want to talk to him about marketing, I'm a, I'm a big Seth Godin fan personally. So when you say that, you are much more likely to have that happen when you begin to notice, where does Seth hang out in person? Where does he hang out online? Oh, he's speaking at this event. Why don't I go there? Why don't I go meet him and shake his hand? And all of a sudden, a lot of things can really start to happen in that direction. So the key is really to be conscious about what are your goals and how can you meet them? And as you in particular, looking at some, some financial goals, that's where you can be working on particular nuggets at a time, being very thrifty. I'm looking at <laughs> Jenny, who's written a lot about that topic of really being effective with your money, um, really utilizing it well, investing well, saving well, so that you know that you need to have that nugget in order to reach your overall plans. So that's really the key, I think, in terms of looking at your life plan. The, the key philosophy for a lot of the things that you're going to try is to test often and fail fast. The first time that you try a new thing, uh, maybe, maybe you want to go and spend one week in the Zurich office, which I think would be much better than trying to lobby to actually get a job there and end up arriving and finding out that it's really not the best fit for you. So you want to look for little tiny ways that you can be uh, chipping away. There's, I don't know how many of you know of PB Wiki. Do you guys know that company here was founded by Ramit Sethi, who's... Um, blogs that I will teach you to be rich. And what he talked about when he first started PB Wiki with David Weeks, his, his friend, they had a, a Gmail account, <laughs> which was like support at pbwiki.com. And they put out a prototype. They did a super happy dev party where they got in 24 hours a bunch of engineers together, a couple cases of Red Bull and some pizza. And they came up with a prototype in 24 hours of the first uh, PB Wiki. Within, they released it. Within 48 hours, they had 1,000 users signed up. And him and David were just sitting there monitoring the Gmail account for any kind of changes that would come in. And real time, they were making changes to the code and, and fixing it as they went along. It's now grown into being you know, much more of a mid-sized company. But that's a perfect example to me of testing often and failing fast. Ramit says that in the time where they started that, they had a whiteboard of about nine different ideas of what they wanted to work on. And they systematically went down and did some of these tests. What they found with that particular product is that it actually had a lot of interest, and they went with it. They followed it, and then, in many ways, they really built the market, they built the infrastructure after they had already done the test. So for some people that have come within a corporate environment where there's not so much flexibility, that can feel a little bit uncomfortable. If you're testing off, and especially the failing fast, which is why I like to take things in little tiny bits, right? 
little, little tiny piece, what's something you can do in order to learn something really you know, quickly or test a particular part of a product. Or if you want to be a speaker, you want to be a writer, write one blog post as opposed to going to shop to New York and trying to get a, a deal with a big publisher. So the key is really being fast and flexible in testing. The other key which I found is really, really critical, it's been very important for me, is who it is that you have around you. And I think about a number of different kinds of people that I've classified first as your posse, your, your kind of creative posse that are people around you who are highly intelligent, who are highly supportive, who are highly driven. Um, sometimes your posse you can find around you at work and sometimes not. I find it's really healthy often to be connected with other people that are outside of your work environment just so that you get other perspectives. And um, your posse is really critical to give that personal support when you're testing off and failing fast, when you're trying things and it might not always work. You want to have people that you can call on that are going to give you really objective feedback about what you're doing. Um, and then they're also going to expect the same thing from you. And it's a really, really critical thing. I have my own posse now in the work that I do of people that are in my same field. In some ways, we could be classified as direct competitors, but we see it as we're all working toward trying to do good things in the market. And it can be good for business, and it can also be good personally. Um, mentors can be very specific people that are maybe technical mentors that have particular expertise. Some people might be more leadership mentors, somebody you can go to for advice about your life or about your career path. And often you want to have a variety of different kinds of mentors to, to supplement and support what you're doing. <clears throat> your High Council of Jedi Knights, are wish I, I, I really wish that I, I would have access to sometimes, who are people who you really, really identify with and you imagine that you could be in that moment where you know, the dark side of the force <laughs> is, is coming in to get you, and you can have a place to go where people whom you really admire are there to give you advice. In my own High Council of Jedi Knights, um, I have some people who I, I know and some people who I don't know. Um, the, an example I was just saying, you know, in looking at the way that people can ha have different roles within your life, with your different circles, your mom's the one who will throw herself in front of a train to save you, right? Your trolls will throw you under the train at the first sign of weakness. <laughs> your mentor is going to warn you to stay off the tracks, and your posse is going to drag the troll back under the bridge, right? <laughs> you, you need to have all of these people around you in order to really be supporting your efforts and to have, you know, some circles of support. The, um, the High Council concept is one for me where I, I often look at it, I don't know if any of you recognize some of these folks here. You saw Seth, who I talked about, Kathy Sierra, who I adore, uh, does a lot of writing about technology, who doesn't write anymore on her blog. But the way I look at my high council are people who, my criteria for high council are not just people who are really smart and very accomplished, but who also live according to the kinds of values that I also share personally. So it would be the kind of person that I would be comfortable having watch my kids in addition to getting business advice from. Now the thing about the high council, which I really encourage you to do, is sometimes you can have people on your high council who might not seem like they're attainable or they're you know, too far out of reach or they wouldn't want anything to do with you. In my own experience, in my experience working with a lot of clients, it is amazing what happens when you actually identify people who may seem to be too famous and out of your reach to be on your high council, it's amazing how often you can begin to build personal relationships with them. That to me is one of the examples of the power of social media where we're, we're really just one quick link or one quick tweet away often from people who we really admire. And that's been my own, my own path um, in the way that I really started my business. When I moved from just uh, doing work as a consultant and wanted to work as helping employees leave and start a business. I <clears throat> didn't obviously want to tap into my old network, right? Because it wouldn't be very ethical to go back to companies who paid me to retain employees <laughs> and try to get those same employees to leave. So I started writing my blog. And I was writing a post one night. I called it an open letter to CEOs across the corporate world. It was a bit of a rant against the way companies are led. And I, at that point, had maybe 100 visitors to my blog, my dad, my sister, my best friend, and a few people who, you know, found me over Google, and um, I sent a message to Guy Kawasaki, some of you might know, um, at Garage Technology Ventures. And I just thought, you know, he might be interested in the post. So I sent him an email, 
And 10 minutes later, he responded back, which just completely shocked me and amazed me. The next day, he blogged about it. This was in 2006. And all of a sudden, I had this gigantic wave of visitors, about 20,000 people that were hitting my blog in, within a week. And it was a really powerful message to me about not waiting to build up enough traffic to then begin to approach somebody. I saw that when you just begin to do your good work, you do work within your sweet spot, and you connect with people on your High Council of Jedi Knights, you might as well go direct. You never know what's going to happen. I've seen it over and over and over again where people end up building relationships with venture capitalists or they end up getting fantastic jobs because they're not afraid with, within a corporation to talk to the people whom they want to talk to. That's about really you standing in your own power with your own backbone and really uh, just building relationships with people that you want to build relationships with. So if you haven't already, think about who your high council is. Look for people. If you don't have a high council, then start to look. What are the qualities and characteristics of people who you really want to aspire to be like? Where are they? Where are they hanging out? What's their own path been like? Which then you can also learn from in order to, to move your own career forward. What's the difference between mentors and in the high council? Is it the mentors are the people who you already know? The, the question was, what's the difference between mentors and high council members? And, and is it just that mentors are people that you know? I, sometimes mentors can definitely be high council members. The way I personally think about it is a mentor usually is more accessible. It might be somebody at work. It might be somebody that's well known in their technical field. But high council members often are really, really uh, have made tremendous progress within their own field, again, in all areas of life. So um, I, I don't want to, can I pick on Larry Ellison? I don't want to really pick on Larry Ellison. But for example, he might be a great mentor to learn certain things from about business, right, based on what he knows. Personally, he would not be somebody that I would choose as a mentor for how to really set up an effective life, right? Because I don't necessarily share, share values or agree on the way in which he runs his life. And at the same time, I think he's done some really cool things on the business side and could probably be an interesting person to learn from. So some people mix that. For me personally, it's people who have more Yoda-like characteristics <laughs> that you really feel like you're getting maybe a little bit almost more spiritual guidance, you know, depending upon whatever framework you have. You know? um, it's more that people who you know you can really count on, who really have your back and have actually gone through the fire themselves. They've really pushed themselves personally and professionally. The, I think a lot of, a lot of what, we're, what we're seeing, which again brings me great joy, <laughs> is that weirdos like all of us, if I may include you in that group, <laughs> companies that are really uh, doing things differently, that are not afraid to talk about the truth of what's really going on in people's minds, people that are working on side hustles, um, people that are not afraid to really be talking openly about what's going on in their life, like we've seen a lot within blogging that's really changed dynamics of conversations, the way that companies are talking to each other, the way that they're talking to their, uh, their, their customers and clients. I think that weirdos, this is a term my friend Charlie Gilkey uses often, uh, he calls it the weirdo syndrome, where if you're the kind of person who wants to make meaning and you want to have a good life, and you're bucking a little bit against convention for people that say, well, you know, just choose a career and stay in the company and stay there for a long time, um, you can really feel like a weirdo. You can feel a little bit out of sorts, like there's something wrong with you. What I really want to reinforce is that there's nothing wrong with you. It's actually the wave of the future of people who are highly creative, who are working in, in you know, unique and different ways are really what's going to create a really pos positive, strong force, not just in business, but I think also in society. This is from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, for those of you who, didn't, who haven't watched that before. The Island of Misfit Toys, who are just my people. <laughs> um, the, one of the other key things I wanted to leave you with is, um, is really to stay fresh. I think the core of innovation, uh, we were actually just talking about this earlier, the core of innovation is something I just learned about. Uh, Robert, this is Robert Plant of, of Led Zeppelin. And he just came into Phoenix recently, and I was reading an article in the paper about the work that he's doing, and he is actively searching out all the young emerging artists. He asked em Emmylou Harris, who's, who's the most interesting musicians to work with and who should I be you know, learning from musically? He's reaching out to those artists and doing shows with them. And he actually is touring with the band name um, Band of Joy, which was the name of the band he was in when he was 17 or 18 years old. 
And the way he described it in the interview is he wanted to really be connected with the root of his passion by touring with that band name, which I thought was so miraculous because he probably would sell a few more tickets if people know that he was from Led Zeppelin, right? He has a lot more personal brand around that name. But what he's really tapping into is keeping fresh, tapping into the source of his passion, staying with the younger generation and not just trying to hold on to success that he's had. And I think that's also a characteristic for companies of not settling and really not getting kind of stuck in a rut where you've been really good and being afraid to engage with the younger, hungrier companies or, or employees. So you really want to stay fresh, stay open, and keep really pushing your, your learning. The other thing is really about, about leading. And this is something I remember when I used to do career development work here in, I was like 1999 and 2000. At that point, we were talking about career self-reliance and how you can never count on one company in order to be leading your career. Um, it is more true now than ever. And when you're in a situation where you're in that ill-fitting shoe, where things are not quite working right, don't wait for somebody else to make the change. Diagnose it, pay attention to where are things out of alignment. Where is your life plan off whack? Maybe you're doing the right kind of work, but you're not working with the right people. Maybe you're doing great work, but you're not getting the right kind of compensation. So when you know that, you're the one that really can be working on those particular tweaks, and you're gonna be a lot more in power and control of your own career. Whenever you're looking to somebody else to make a decision about your career is where you really start to lose power. And remember that you have a lot of different options now. Knowing we're all self-employed, you can look at different ways in which you can be bringing certain parts of this life plan into your, into your work, work life. Um, it's probably the, the greatest change I see in people when they're in a situation. I get a lot of messages from people who are disgruntled in their cubicles, <laughs> given the name of my blog. Um, but often, it's not the fault of the corporation. It's the fact that they've totally given up ownership for their own career. And once they start to shift that, some people find that they're actually uh, happy once they evaluate the situation and see that certain things are, are actually working well. Um, so I'd love to, to open it up and, and see what, what kind of questions that you might have about entrepreneurship or life plan, and any, any kind of questions, bring them on. You've been a quiet group so far. You can come up to the microphone right here on the side. All right, excellent. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. It was an amazing mm -hmm. talk. Um, I'm curious to hear more about what set you on the path of writing your book and sharing your message in your blog. Yes, well, what, what set me on my path was actually all the work that I did within corporations for so long. I often was in this very capacity of in companies here talking to employees about some kind of a corporate initiative. And what I would find is, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure if the same is true now, but what I would often find is, that there was this whole other dialogue that was going on in the minds of employees as they were, as I was addressing them on behalf of the corporation. And the only way I would ever know is when people would pull me aside after a talk and they'd say, you know, I know I said that everything's fine here. It's really not fine. You know, I really can't stand my manager or I really don't like my job or I really want to start a business and I have no idea how to do it. And so that's really, it was like market research for 10 years going into lots of different companies, which on the outside were very successful. But I noticed that there were a lot of people who, who really just didn't feel happy and wanted to leave and start a business. And the puzzling thing to me was that there's tons of great books about starting a business. I, most of them have already been written well before I even started my blog. The difference is what people didn't talk about often is the fear that a company's making a big change. And so a lot of what I started to write about was what happens when you begin to go down the path of creating a company when all the, the doubts and the fear, you know, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Will people like me? Is my product good? You know, who are my mentors? I've been here, here my whole career. You know, how can I start to build my network? Those were more things about fear that came up. So that was really the gist of it. And I started writing my blog a couple years after I started is when my publisher approached me about doing a book. And I also had been working with a lot of individuals who are actually making that transition. And that's how, that's how it came about. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. So the question is, I'm a coach, and so I do I have success stories about people who have started a business? I have a lot of success stories. <laughs> I am massively, massively proud of, of my clients. They, they've, they've done their own work. Um, I have people who have done everything from left high-level jobs. One of my, my current clients is actually was a VP at a large corporation, had many dreams for a startup. She worked in technology and entertainment. And um, she is uh, doing it. She got her developer team going in Buenos Aires and is getting the product done. She's lined up a whole bunch of um, actually investors and also companies who are ready to buy into the company. So she's been doing the whole, you know, from start to finish, from conception of the product all the way through. I have um, one of my other clients right now, too, who just raised $10,000 toward a documentary that she's doing. She has. Um, borderline personality disorder, BPD, if you've ever heard of that, which is a mental illness. And she is a graphic designer in New York, and she's training for the Golden Gloves also, training for boxing, uh, a Golden Gloves boxing championship. And so she's creating a documentary that's called The Fight Within Us, which is um, following her along, kind of documenting her experience with BPD, but also using the metaphor of boxing, of really training for the fight within the ring. So she just worked on a project where she just raised $10,000 for one stage of the project. That's kind of a different kind of, kind of um, story. But for her, it's more about a, a social cause. And then I have lots and lots of people who have just done the, gone from corporate employee to you know, become a consultant or started smaller, smaller jobs. So it's, um, I'm tremendously proud of my clients. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm thinking about the slide that you had where the building blocks, you know, you had like the two blocks and then it builds up to your full picture. And I think it's nice to think of it kind of you add, you add, but I'm wondering if you can speak to sometimes you have to subtract first. Like if you have financial goals and you want to start your own business, it might be that you're starting your business and have to subtract financial goals to get yes. and then eventually get there. So yes. it's not that nice, neat path sometimes. Exactly, exactly. And it, uh, so much of it is about choice, especially, as you said, you have three little ones. <laughs> I know time is often a factor. Money is often a factor. Learning how to say no is one of the best skills. If you really want to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> learn how to say no, because a lot of it is about really being focused on what you're doing, clarifying your priorities. Jenny and I were just talking about the time she spent writing her book where she had to say no to a whole bunch of social engagements and other things she was doing. And so you're absolutely right. What I'm thinking about in that context is actively going after skills, resources, experience that you can get in order to make the time to do that is often where you do need to subtract things. And that's where anytime people say, well, you know, I have a full-time job, there's no way I could do it, there is a way to do it. I, I guarantee if you start to look into the way that you're working and the way that your outside life is, there are ways to work in little tiny turtle steps to make it happen. So I'm, I'm totally with you. And I don't believe in work-life balance at all. I've learned a long time ago that um, often there are choices and they're not always easy choices, right? Sometimes you make a choice to not you know, do one thing um, in order to make something else happen and it's not always perfect. And that's okay. It's kind of beautiful imperfection. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Um, so I was spending some time in the in the uh, starting your own business section at, in uh, Amazon. Or yes. Sorry, not Amazon. Uh, well, online and also in, in the bookstore. It's just really easy to get overwhelmed with all the books that are on yeah. on the shelf, <laughs> um, claiming to be able to help you. Are there anything any books or reference guides you'd recommend that sort of um, could give you the foundation of kind of checklist things you should consider? So everything from like you know, uh, legally, what kind of things you need to be considering, insurance. Um, so just you know, something like yes, that. Yes, kind of the nuts and bolts, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I think for the, um, it, I, I'm not sure the nature of the company, but I, a checklist for some of the nuts and bolts of the structure of a company, the meaning, the purpose, the essence. I really like the art of the start, which Guy Kawasaki wrote, which goes through some good elements to look at. What is your message? What's your market? How do you organize the business plan side? Um, there is a book uh, I think it's Rhonda Abramson, I hope I get her name right, which is, I think, six weeks to start up. And that tends to be a lot more of the checklist kind of elements. There's also startupnation.com, which is a site that has 10 steps to open for business. And they have a lot of checklists in terms of legal agreements and health insurance. I don't, health insurance was one of the biggest issues that people often come to me about because it's often a concern. I actually wrote a whole chapter about it in my book because it was such a big issue for people. So there is some information there. 
some of it, I think, depends on the nature of the kind of company that you're starting. And I'm a huge believer in getting as much as you can for free, absolutely. Like, get as much free advice as you can, and then certain things you don't want to scrimp on. Like, really talk to a good accountant, a CPA, a lawyer about what kind of business structure, for example, you want to set up, and talk to a really reputable um, insurance broker. And if you have, depending upon your own financial situation, talk to a good financial planner also, you know, just to make sure that you're mitigating risk. It's in the spirit of test often and fail fast. Nothing scares me more as a coach than somebody who says, hey, you know, I'm quitting my job tomorrow, when they haven't thought about how are you really mitigating your risk. So, you know, there's a lot you can learn for free, but then certain things, make sure you get really good advice. And I usually go with a mentor or a high counsel um, recommendation for the kind of people who are good to work with. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me here. I've had a great time, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. You can find me at escapefromcubiclenation.com or Pam Slim on Twitter. Thanks for having me.